most are the outlaws of the computer age. Snooping, stealing, spreading viruses. No one has a good word for them today. But it wasn't always so. This hacker started a revolution in computers. And this is the hacker who inspired him. And this is the hacker who followed in their footsteps and paid the price. These three technological rebels are the pioneers of hacking. For Steve Wozniak, hacking is about invention. We were making a difference for humanity with these little small computers. For John Draper, experimentation. You know, take it apart and make it better, make it do different things, make it do cooler things. For Kevin Mitnick, hacking is about subversion. It's about the forbidden knowledge, it's about pranksterism, about trying to outsmart the other. It's about the knowledge, the intellectual challenge. The word hacker actually had two meanings. Before it meant something about breaking into computers or something, it meant guys who sit all night long on any piece of borrowed equipment they can, right. trying to get programmed so ultimately perfect. Their oh, stories oh, reveal how hackers were the heroes of the computer revolution, but became outlaws in the world that they created. Hi. Hi. Where does this wire go? Well, you see, this is telephone wire. And it's going to run from your house to the big cable on top of that pole. We imagine hacking to be all about computers, but it wouldn't be possible without the telephone network. And that's where hacking began. In 1970, John Draper was fresh out of the military and was studying electronic engineering when he stumbled across a secret world. It all began with a call from a guy named Denny, who promised to reveal the secrets of a new craze, phone freaking. He started to explain to me about phone freaks. I said, what's a phone freak? And he was explaining to me, well, we play with phones. I said, yeah, I can see that. I said, well, what do you do with phones? And he said, well, we, well, we understand the system. I said, can you make free calls? He said, well, why don't you come on over? I got a couple of friends over here that want to talk to you. I go to the door. His dad answers the door. I says, I'm here to see Denny. He says, ah, come with me. He takes me in his room, open up his room, and it's like pitch dark in there. He says, would you mind turning on the lights? Because they're all blind. They don't need lights. So we got to talking, and I said, show me one of these ways of making a free call. I'm really interested. We knew, of course, that it was illegal, and I, I guess be a part of the thrill of it. And, and it was, it was, it wasn't really just to rip out the phone company. I mean, it was the, it was the technical challenge to be able to do it. At a time when calling long distance was a luxury, phone freaks found a way of doing it for free. Telephone networks were controlled by tones. Getting in was easy with the right equipment. It came in the shape of a free gift in a packet of breakfast cereal. This guy right here, the Captain Crunch whistle. And if you glue this hole right here like this, that's 2600. When you blow the whistle into the phone, a little kerchink sound, that's the acknowledgement coming in from the other side saying, you're ready to process the call. Armed with a Captain Crunch whistle, phone freaks could seize control of telephone lines anytime, any place, anywhere. In fact, one of the things that we used to do is to go to the cent go to the airport, walk along blowing the whistle next to a bank of payphones, <laughs> and disconnect their calls. In the days when calls went through to operators, phone freaking wasn't possible. But as human switchboards were replaced by mechanical systems, different noises were used to trigger the switches. If you had perfect pitch like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. Let's see if I make it this time. This is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing about now. 
Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while. He even do. showed off his skills for the local media. Now, From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand-mile phone call by whistling. Joe Ingressia says he used to do these things because he is fascinated by the technology. Those are the precursor to the hackers. Those are the founding fathers. <laughs> For phone freaks like Captain Crunch and Denny, the telephone system was a huge technological playground full of sounds and switches to explore. Thirty years on, they're getting together to relive their exploits. Hi, Denny. Hey, buddy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, buddy. Hey, go on, buddy. Denny. Yeah. Let's go phone trip. I got to try out my new box. The golden rule was never freak from home. If you did, the phone company could trace you. During the time that I was with Denny, I would pile Denny up in the Volkswagen van. We'd go out to the absolute smallest rural area we could find on a map. Go out there and just camp out at a payphone and start hacking. Once they knew the tones that controlled the switches, Phone freaks could travel down the lines from exchange to exchange and from city to city. But they needed better ways to make the tones. This was where John Draper's engineering expertise came in. Phone freaking was about to go high tech with the invention of a gadget called the Blue Box. First thing I did was build a Blue Box. The case you can get down at Radio Shack or anywhere else. It's just a standard old project case. The keyboard pad, I can think we got that from like a junkyard or something like that. Here we go. The blue box is nothing more than a tone generating device that generates a certain set of tones. And the phone company thinks these tones are coming from their own switching equipment when indeed they're only coming from you, basically. It's the keys of the kingdom. If I wanted an operator in New York, I do key pulse, one, two, one, start, and it connects me to the operator in New York. Your call cannot be completed. Equipped with a blue box, phone freaks make calls all over the world, often just for the fun of hearing a recorded message in a foreign language. The fact the phone company allowed the system to be set up that way was really flabbergasting me. I couldn't believe that it was that easy to do. KP182 start. The patterns of the numbers really intrigued me. I was actually in the in an upper level uh, access to the phone company. I was I was in a in a real raw level of access. Blue box technology was Freaking's big bang. The illicit network expanded. And before long, phone freaks were holding secret meetings on conference lines deep inside the system. Most, most people would just talk about phones. Most people would talk about, you know, usual things kids talk about, their girlfriends and phones and things like that. We had a girl on here, you know, from California. She played operator. It said she had a person-to-person -person call from Jerry Doyle in Miami. The conferences of those days were kind of like what the chat rooms are today. I'm in Florida, Derek. Hi. Uh, I never talked to you before. Are you in Australia? No, I'm in England. Oh, England. I can't tell the two accents apart, you see. It was a social place for me to meet my friends or friends that were in the same interest that I had. Gee, it's funny being on a conference without, without Big Mouth Jeff, man. <laughs> it was kind of like a secret society. This is the smallest, lightest, most easily concealed blue box now made by underground scientists. But the secret society was growing. When phone freaks have a convention, people don't give their right names. Masks are given out at the door. The only phone freaks, I think, had, uh, did their freaking with the hacker mentality. Uh, one of the most complex systems on Earth at that time was the phone system. And to be able to know its ins and outs was you know, a very rich field of discovery. There was a guy that called himself around the world from the one payphone, around the world with a payphone beside him. He's like, hello, and there's a lag, and hello, how are you? I'm fine, you know? It wasn't just mechanical switches that the phone freaks learned to manipulate. They also became skilled at manipulating phone company employees, an art they called social engineering. Social engineering aspect of freaking, Denny was the expert on that. That's just, a, that's just the ability of going in and talking to people on the inside of the phone company 
uh, making them believe that you're working for the phone company. Ron, how you doing? Good, buddy. This is uh, Bob from the uh, Alpine office in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We had a test uh, that we needed to run, a, a transmission test, and we needed to have the sleeve lead uh, broken off on the uh, intercept strap and then put the strap back on. We can call the switch room, we can call the frame room, we can say, well, this is uh, Fresno here. we got translation error going into your trunk here. Could you pull up trunk number of this, that, and the other thing and, and give me the trunk ID code for this, that, and the other thing, you know? I mean, and the guy would do it. When the phone companies finally noticed the intrusion, they were less than happy. You know, a lot of us were certainly warned a number of times by, uh, you know, phone company uh, special agents and that kind of thing, phone company, uh, telephone company security people. The phone freaks conferences were soon buzzing with stories about investigations by phone company agents, in particular the notorious Mr. Duffy. Well, Mr. Duffy decided that he would pay Bill a visit. Mm -hmm. Bill's mother didn't feel like uh, keeping Mr. Duffy from doing anything, you see. One of the chief special agents used to talk to me sometimes. He also talked to my dad sometimes in, you know, hopes, of course, of getting me to, you know, to quit. And then, of course, Duffy visited Bill at his school, and uh, I don't think Bill said anything. I, I guess, you know, we, we'd stop for a little while, but then it's the, the old thing. You, you had fun doing it, and you kind of go back and, and do it again. Mr. Duffy would soon be eclipsed by a far greater threat, nationwide media exposure, thanks to New York journalist Ron Rosenbaum. It was like entering this uh, Alice in Wonderland uh, electronic outlaw underground. They were sending messages outside the accepted channels, but they were also inventing hacker sensibility. I think one thing the, uh, the phone freaks responded to was a kind of generalized paranoia about phones and about communication. I think because of the, uh, the anti-war movement, um, and FBI reaction to that, everyone thought their phones were being uh, tapped. The phone was sort of a focus for a kind of generalized uh, paranoia about government intrusion, lack of privacy, that sort of thing. Rosenbaum tracked down Denny and Joe and Gracia, but Captain Crunch proved elusive. Captain Crunch is like one of the great American characters, a homegrown superhero fantasy. Everybody that Ron Rosenbaum interviewed, they talked about Captain Crunch. So I called him and I said, hey, look, we would really like you not to publish this article because it's really not a good thing. Captain Crunch was very worried about this because he kept telling me, you know, whatever you do, I don't want this information to get into the hands of the radical underground because he felt that it could paralyze the phone system in the U.S. and somehow uh, bring, a, bring upon nuclear surrender by the U.S. to the, the Soviet Union. In October 1971, Ron Rosenbaum's article on phone freaks was published in Esquire magazine. I went to the library and I read, I read the article and I, my, just my, I couldn't believe it. It was just so exposing. I said, oh my God. And I knew right then and there that phone freaking as I knew it was ended. I read it to Denny over the phone, the whole thing. And everybody got on a conference call. One of the last conference calls we had on, I read the article to everybody because they couldn't read it and they couldn't believe it. I said, you guys really screwed up. You guys shouldn't have let this guy talk to you. Shouldn't have given this guy all this information. After the Esquire article, everyone jumped on the bandwagon. Hey, everybody. Whose number is 237-4059? These parasites piled on afterwards, mainly for the idea of stealing, um, in some cases, uh, just like youthful vandalism, you know, you know, hey, I'm doing something wrong, isn't that cool? But in other cases, for profit. In our uh, uh, accelerated program to catch phone freaks, uh, which is uh, more successful all the time, uh, we find that we, uh, we detect people who are businessmen, uh, we find uh, private detectives, stockbrokers, uh, automobile dealers. Uh, we've even found some, uh, some members of organized crime. The backlash hit the pioneers of phone freaking as hard as it hit the parasites. The LA people got busted. The Seattle people got busted. The New York people got busted. They came in. They had grand jury investigations coming in. They came to visit me, gave me a search warrant, searched my place. Since I wasn't really as heavily into it as some, I just got like a 10-day uh, 
10 days in jail, three years probation, it was suspended. And of course, everybody that got busted had my number. And I was, I was made the kingpin because of the article. The authorities came down hard. Possession of a blue box could get you two years in jail. It was that one unlucky time that I just happened to have it. I get out of the car, right? And three cars went, one in front of my car, one in the back of my car, two in the side of the car, and the FBI just jumped and grabbed me right there. Captain Crunch was federally indicted for wire fraud and served a total of four months in jail. I was the black hat hacker, uh, only for phones. I was like the bad, evil guy. Phone freaking was dead, but not buried. A worldwide revolution in technology was about to explode, and Captain Crunch would be there to inspire a whole new generation of hackers. Hacking had begun as the playful exploration of the phone network, but this was all about to change with the invention of the personal computer, a revolution in technology inspired by the hackers themselves. Key to the whole revolution was a young engineering student called Steve Wozniak, whose world had been turned upside down by the Esquire article on blue boxing. It was the most amazing article I'd ever read. It was about engineers and technical people like myself outsmarting phone companies and setting up networks that nobody imagined existed. Wozniak was so enthused by the article that he set about building his own blue box. At first I was just sticking some chips of my own design into a little, a little blank board and soldering wires onto them. So when I got the blue box built, some of the tones were right and some were wrong. So we started looking for Captain Crunch. After his cover had been blown by Esquire, John Draper was trying to keep a low profile. He'd even stopped his occasional appearances on local pirate radio. Everyone said John Draper was Captain Crunch. So we put a call into the radio station. We asked for John Draper to call us. And they said, oh, he dropped out of sight right after the Esquire article. And we knew we had the right one. Ten minutes later, the phone rang. I said, oh, my God, this is bad news. It was him, and he said he'd come up to Berkeley to meet us in the dorm. And I felt like, you know, like if you were bringing the president home. I, I kind of walked into this thing not really knowing what was going on and was wanted me to show him how to use the blue box. He just built it. This guy was supposed to be, in my mind, so suave with the girls. And when he showed up at the door, he didn't quite fit the image I had in my head. But he said, I am he, Captain Crunch. And I says, look, you guys, uh, I really don't think I want to do this. He says, it's cool, it's cool. God, I felt like a hero. I said, well, I guess, uh, I guess it'll be okay because I'm in, a, I'm in a dorm and it'd be pretty hard to like, track any one person making this call. And Juan says, can we call the Pope? I said, I guess so. So I got the number to the Vatican and we called the Vatican and we asked for the Pope. And he said, well, the Pope's not available right now. <laughs> it's like four in the morning started learning learning um, codes that night from uh, from John Draper and from other people and techniques to use and talking operators into things and started practicing on my own over the weeks and seeing what I could couldn't accomplish and th I think I was kind of scared that I could get caught a couple of weeks later Wozniak's car broke down luckily he and his college buddy Steve Jobs happened to have their blue box with them We'll try to make a blue box call back to our friends in Berkeley because they can drive us home. And Steve made the blue box call and the operator came on the line and he hung up all scared. And he made the call again and she came on the line and he hung up. He was just scared and a cop showed up. He was inside the, the phone with a box in his hand. Oh my God. The cop probably thought we were like druggies because I had long hair. Steve managed to pass me the blue box and I got it in my coat pocket and said, what's this? Well, if you push the buttons, they all made tones. So I said, it's an electronic music synthesizer. The cop says, sounds out of tune to me. He says, what's the orange button for? That's the one you see his phone lines with. So Steve said, that's for calibration. He said, well, it needs calibrating. This is scary. We, were just, we knew we were caught. They got us in their car, two cops in the front seat, Steve and I in the back, and the cop in the passenger seat turned around. And the cop hands it back to Waz and says, a guy by the name of Moog beat you to it. Moog synthesizer. While Steve Wozniak and Captain Crunch were messing about with phones, the big boys at the corporations in nearby Silicon Valley were making great advances in computer technology. But in the early 70s, computers were still vast impersonal machines serving vast impersonal corporations. Computers 
software started, you know, for code breaking, tracking missiles, wartime uses. You know, and that really is the origin of where the modern computer came from. And then it moved to these big business database, you know, complications. Computers had been seen as uh, things to never touch, uh, never even be in the same room with a computer. Keep your distance, but be reverent. Be very respectful of those who knew how to do it. But respect was in short supply. In the late 1960s, even computer engineers had a counterculture. They called it hacking. It was a radical approach to computers. Practical goals took second place to what hackers called the wild pleasure of exploration, a sentiment that phone freaks would recognize. Phone freaking was learning how to use a technology, how to uh, penetrate and, and utilize and expand the technology in ways that weren't generally available to the general public. In the same way, computer hacking is pushing the frontier, learning how to exploit computers and get them to do things that people said simply couldn't be done. For computer hackers to get their kicks, they had to get their hands on computers, which at the time was easier said than done. I had told my dad in my first year of college, someday I will own a 4K Nova computer. And he said, Steve, it costs as much as a house. I said, then I'll live in an apartment. I'm going to have a computer someday in my life. When computers were vast number crunching machines costing five billion dollars to develop, the idea of having your own computer, a personal computer, was inconceivable. Why would anyone want his or her own personal computer? That's ridiculous. It's like wanting your personal atom bomb or something like that. The bomb came in the shape of a new piece of kit called the Altair 8800. An article in a technical magazine appeared introducing the Altair, which was a computer kit that you could build. This so excited a couple people in the Bay Area, they decided to form a club. Even before the, the pieces of these computers uh, were shipped out, uh, just to talk about them and share information about them. And they called it the Homebrew Computer Club. Thirty people eventually wound up uh, one night in March of 1975 to stand in a garage and look at this box. Among them was Steve Wozniak, and contained within this box was a network which would come to fascinate him even more than the telephone system. Sitting in a garage, rainy outside and dark, and the garage doors open to the outside darkness, and they started all talking about these computers going around. The Altair was pretty meaningless as a box. It came out, and once you put it together and flicked the switches, you got it to run, and then you said, well, gee, this is real nice, but what can I do with it? What they did with it was program it to play Daisy. Fifteen years earlier, computer engineers had coaxed the tune from a machine the size of a house. Now the hackers were doing it for themselves on a home-built kit computer. My interest from that first meeting just sprung up so strongly that every two weeks of my life, that was the most important thing I could do. The homebrew club quickly outgrew the garage. Computer hacking was catching on. Someone would stand up and say, I've got this problem. Anybody know how to solve this? Or, hey, you know that problem that was mentioned at Homebrew uh, two weeks ago? I found a solution to it. And it was, it was a phenomenal information exchange. I just passed out sets of schematics to anyone in the club that wanted them. I Xeroxed tons of copies because, hey, I felt kind of proud they'd be seeing my work. Lee Felsenstein, who became the moderator of the computer club, very consciously uh, set it up you know, as a hackerish enterprise. Total sharing of information. It didn't attract high-level people who have been successful in companies, business types. Didn't attract real engineers. The hard engineer would be blocked by his feeling that I have to have permission in order to do what's never been done before. We were there because we knew that we didn't need permission. Hackers set out to achieve the impossible, to build their own computers. It was the lure of, this was finally computer technology that you can actually have your hands on, you can actually control. Every time someone brought a computer, introduced a computer into the homebrew club, the first thing people would do is just rush up, take it apart, and learn everything about it, and just pester the designer with zillions of questions. You know, how's this work? Where's that, you know, uh, pin go to that pin? Uh, what kind of bus is this? 
Driven by their fascination for exploring technology, hackers didn't really care what their computers might actually do. Nobody had a practical reason why they wanted to have a personal computer. There were some excuses made up, like uh, balance your, your checkbook, uh, or uh, keep recipes, or control things around the house. But almost nobody ever did that. That's function guilt. That's, well, I mean, do you ask somebody, well, yes, but what can you do with your model train? No, I play with it. I enjoy it. It's fun to diddle with it. It's fun to experiment. But out of experimentation came genuine advances. My head started drifting and thinking and came up with a clever little trick that if I just took a bit of data and circled it around in a circle, it would, oddly enough, if I kept the timings exactly perfect and right, it would show up as color on a colored TV. It's my belief that the really important things we have on the computers came from the hackers. The homebrewers made computers do unthinkable things. They played games and music on them. They created graphics and drawing programs. At Homebrew, hacking was enjoying its golden age. Steve Wozniak labored day and night in his garage to produce his perfect computer. Woz, I believe, qualifies as the greatest all-around hacker. Uh, he could design the hardware, he could design the software right from the pencil and paper level uh, and make it go. If anybody ever looked at my circuit, they would start to see that, whoa, this guy doesn't just do straight designs like you're taught. He could see things that other people don't see and, you know, make connections that other people don't make. What I love about hackers is that they have a, a different, maybe enhanced way of, of looking at the world to make those kinds of connections. Hackers would experiment with any hardware or software they could get their hands on, even if they didn't own it. But not everyone was into the idea of sharing. In 1976, the Homebrew Club received a stinging letter from another computer pioneer. As the majority of hobbyists must be aware, most of you steal your software. Who cares if the people who worked on it get paid? Most directly, the thing you do is theft. In what became a key moment in the history of the computer industry, Bill Gates wrote an angry letter to the homebrew people saying, wait a minute, I wrote this for money. You can't distribute this. This isn't free. This is work. Bill Gates' letter was a sign of things to come. Personal computers were about to become big business, as Steve Wozniak found out when his garage invention became the first Apple computer. In inventing the Apple I, he really didn't care about inventing a product. He just wanted a computer that would work the way he wanted it to, that had all the peculiarities to it and all the, all the design features in it that a computer hobbyist would like to have. Steve Jobs, his, his high school buddy, who didn't do the hardware or the software, said, oh, hey, you know, we could sell these things, and was as well, cool, man. Wozniak and Jobs' new company quickly followed the Apple I with the Apple II. Woz's hobby computer was transformed into the hottest consumer product around. The Apple II introduced the idea that it was completely in a plastic case like a hi-fi or a radio that you bought. You just take it home and turn it on and it starts working. Assembling the first apples by hand in Woz's bedroom, it had looked like a bit of a long shot. But the balance sheet at Apple soon told a different story. I got a phone call from Steve, and he said, guess what? I got a $50,000 order. When you're putting up a few hundred bucks each, wondering if you're getting your money back, and he says he's got a $50,000 order, it is such a huge shake in your world. What? By 1982, Apple sales had reached over half a billion dollars a year. But hacking and business were not compatible. The days of the homebrew computer club were numbered. Maybe I went to a few more homebrew meetings, but pretty much it started becoming not the big thing in my life. The big thing in my life started becoming more and more Apple Computer, the company. Now I had to put, you know, more of my full-time energy into things that were going into products being sold. With companies like Apple uh, forming and becoming serious businesses, uh, secrets became introduced into it. You couldn't tell your colleagues in the homebrew computer club what your product plans were what you were working on because uh, you know competitors might be there and they would you know say oh 
you know, Apple's doing that. You know, let's, let's get a similar project going ourselves. I think it ultimately led to the end of Homebrew. The Homebrew Computer Club met for the last time in 1986, leaving behind not just Apple, but 23 computer companies founded by its members. Hackers could claim to have created the modern world, but it was a world in which they would no longer be welcome. February 15, 1995, a two-year manhunt ended when armed FBI agents tracked down a wanted criminal to an apartment building in North Carolina. Hacking was about to become an outlaw profession. FBI, come to the door. I have a warrant for your arrest. About 1.30 in the morning, a knock comes on my door. And I didn't look at the clock, because if I looked at the clock, I wouldn't have even answered. Well, who is it? And they said, FBI. The FBI had come for Kevin Mitnick, a 32-year-old hacker whose intrusion into other people's computers had made him public enemy number one. Mitnick was sort of in the wrong place at the wrong time for a lot of reasons. Um, the internet was, you know, starting to take off. There was more at stake at that time. And I think Mitnick, for the media and for some in the government, made a great scapegoat and was a great sort of boogeyman. Twenty years before Mitnick's arrest, hackers had sparked the computer revolution. Members of the Homebrew Computer Club had wrested control of computers away from the corporations and put it in the hands of ordinary people. Kevin Mitnick was a child of that revolution. When I was in school, it was all about partying, smoking dope, going to drink, and stuff like that. And I was just really not into that, and I wasn't that socialized for whatever reason. And I would find hobbies that were, you know, basically solo-type hobbies. For Mitnick's generation, there was a whole new electronic playground to explore. Corporations and government agencies were beginning to link up their computers. The telephone system offered a back way into these seductive networks. It was a, like a, the network was the universe. Star Trek. It going where no man has gone before. The computer network, the phone network, going where no hacker has gone before. He didn't have his own computer, and he started hacking at Radio Shack stores and actually was using the modems and the Radio Shack computers to break into computers in other places. The new generation of hackers took their inspiration from electronic outlaws of an earlier age, like the phone freak Captain Crunch. He was like somebody even that I looked up to because of his intelligence and because of his ability and his knowledge about the telephone system. Like the phone freaks, Mitnick employed a range of skills to achieve his hacks. Just as important as technical know-how was social engineering, the ability to wheedle or trick useful information out of unsuspecting employees. But Mitnick took things a stage further. At age 17, he and his friends bluffed their way past a guard into the headquarters of the telephone company and stole important technical manuals. It was like we were in the candy store, right? We wanted to read all the manuals to figure out how this whole system worked. The offense earned him a juvenile sentence. The phone company was just irked that somebody had the audacity or the chutzpah to go do this type of stuff and didn't care about their security procedures and their security procedures were ineffective. Mitnick's arrest set the pattern for the future. Kevin kept getting in trouble. Kevin had this, uh, this uh, really remarkable ability to keep getting arrested. Mitnick wasn't the only one getting into trouble. NASA officials in Huntsville realized in late June unauthorized people had recently and repeatedly penetrated a computer at Marshall Space Flight Center. They were smart enough to, uh, in effect, erase the login, logout file. The hackers, as they call themselves, were not only smart, they were arrogant. They left messages on the computer, such as, you can't catch me. It's almost you know, like a biological thing. You know, people are hardwired to be hackers or not to be hackers. And you can see it in kids. Some kids just take to computers uh, saying, oh my God, this is a way that I can finally express this part of myself. The phone taps led the FBI to the homes of four teenagers, all of whom attend an exclusive high school. That's where Michael Strickland says he got the NASA computer number. And it was listed 
on the list as a regular Huntsville modem number, which was obviously a mistake, but I just decided to give it a call. The term hacking began to uh, become affected by people who weren't infused with a hacker spirit doing break-ins. There were these teenage computer break-ins that managed to get hold of passwords or use uh, system weaknesses to get into other computers. It took a Hollywood movie to turn irritation into panic. All of a sudden, there's this movie that becomes a number one box office hit of War Games, and that really glorifies how the ability to use computers to break into these very powerful systems and, you know, and almost start World War III. The meaning of the term hacker flipped overnight. A hacker was a pimply-faced kid who had enough savvy to... Um, you know, attack a, a, a computer network belonging to a large military organization. The thrill was being somewhere where you shouldn't be and trying to remain undetectable. It's about the forbidden knowledge. It's about pranksterism, about trying to outsmart the other. It's about the knowledge, the intellectual challenge, you know, circumventing certain computer security measures. It's about, you know, an escape, too. As the computer network expanded, so did Mitnick's passion for exploration. He was now in the habit of leaving his wife, checking into a cheap motel, and hacking 24-7. With the advent of the Internet, there was no holding him back. To this day, the Internet is difficult to secure because it was really built to get those pieces of information moving around well, without encumbrances. And, you know, it was built on open principles. You can't own the IP protocols that run the Internet, so everyone could use them. But times were changing fast. Hacking's frontier days were over. The Internet was set to become a tool of business. Hackers were no longer welcome. Back in the late 70s and early 80s, computer hacking was actually encouraged. It was the cool thing to do. It, was, it wasn't really looked at as a crime, but as a cutesy, pranksterism-type hobby. And as society changed around me, because I was just so into phone freaking and computer hacking because of just the passion and the interest that it had for me, that I completely ignored how society was changing around me. The exploits of hackers like Mitnick became a problem for law enforcement. Things had changed. This wasn't the world of the homebrew computer club. Hacking was a matter for the FBI. Cybercrime has gained a higher profile as we've become, as computers and the Internet have become more pervasive and we've gotten a lot more complaints. But this was a new kind of crime. There were no broken windows, getaway cars, or fingerprints. We, we've had to keep pace with not only the new technology, but the new in innovative techniques of, of the perpetrators. Undeterred, Mitnick chose bigger and bigger targets. In 1988, he hacked into the network of computer giant DEC and copied details of top-secret software. Before long, the FBI were on to him. We opened an investigation into his theft of developmental uh, operating system software from Digital Equipment Corporation, and uh, he was arrested in 1988. Uh, pled guilty in 1989 and subsequently sentenced to federal prison time. DEC claimed the dark side hacker had caused four million dollars of damage. In court, Mitnick realized just how frightened the world had become of hackers. I had a federal prosecutor walk into court and tell a federal magistrate that if Mr. Mitnick got near a telephone in the prison that inmates could use to make collect calls, that he could start a nuclear war. And I'm sitting there in court, right? I'm going, well, the judge isn't that stupid. The, the judge really believed a lot of the hype in the case and put him in solitary confinement. So he threw me into solitary confinement for eight months based on some fear that I could start a nuclear war from the payphone. He had, I believe, at most an hour out of his cell during a 24-hour day in shackles. And um, Mitnick was extremely bitter about this. In 1989, after a year in jail, Mitnick was released on probation and ordered to attend a rehabilitation center for what the judge had called his computer addiction. Eventually, he was allowed home to his father's apartment, but he was a marked man. The phone company were monitoring all three of my dad's telephone lines at our apartment. I wanted to find out 
who was behind it all and why. So I figured out who the investigators were at Pacific Bell that had this equipment set up. So I went about collecting intelligence. And how does one collect intelligence? By intercepting communications. So I was able to get their voicemail passwords for their voicemail system. You know, like you have one for your home. I was listening to the messages and trying to gain any information they had were discussing me. Well, the government characterized it as breaking into a computer. So they issued a warrant for violating my supervised release. And I was just pissed off. So I just said, hey, catch me if you can. When the FBI came to arrest Mitnick in December 1992, he was gone. He was on the run because he didn't trust the government and he didn't trust the FBI. And he believed um, if he talked to them, they would put him back in jail and he would be right back in solitary and he'd do anything not to be back in that cell again. It was, a, it was an adventure. I went to a town, went to a hotel, you know, found a place to live, found employment at a law firm, and just started my life from scratch. But of course, I had to build a past. And I did that myself. I, you know, built fake references, uh, built an, an identity so I can support myself. What I did is I downloaded all the information of everybody that graduated with a computer science degree and then I looked for a name that I would like and I saw this name Eric Weiss and I knew that Eric Weiss was the real name of Harry Houdini as I was working at this law firm in Denver um, for about a year a little bit over a year under the name of Eric Weiss and what my downfall was is I could continue to still engage in my hobby of hacking. Mitnick could break into um, a system by calling people on his cell phone while he was walking home, conning managers, secretaries, even executives into information. Kevin was systematically attacking uh, the computers of uh, some of the world's largest cellular telephone manufacturers and he was stealing their source code. Mitnick was now hacking with a purpose, to keep one step ahead of the law. By hacking into mobile phone companies and copying the blueprints to their phones, he was able to make untraceable calls. He was able to elude us by virtue of, of knowing the uh, telephone and the computer systems well enough to, to know what could be figured out and how quickly it would take to do that. So he definitely played the systems well. He never had any idealized goal or any, any real objective other than to keep hacking and keep staying one step ahead of the FBI. Mitnick's notoriety soon spread. In the summer of 1994, the FBI's failure to catch their internet outlaw became front page news, thanks to journalist John Markoff. It was simply a good story. I mean, here is a guy who has been arrested before, who's managed to use his skills to avoid law enforcement. I mean, that's, that's a good yarn. He created the myth of Kevin Mitnick, the John Dillinger of cyberspace. I think there were more than 60 unsourced allegations stated as fact, such as breaking into NORAD, climbing false news story about Security Pacific Bank, about wiretapping the FBI. Markov's portrait of Mitnick tapped into the growing fears of businesses and members of the public who were just getting used to the idea of a life lived online. That was the time when the internet was being talked about, the World Wide Web was coming out, and people were actually saying, we can make use of this in our daily lives and in, and in business. And if we're going to be using this in business, we're going to need to make sure that it's secure because if I'm going to put in millions of dollars and I'm going to have customer information or company information available to anybody over the net. I want to make sure it's available only to those people who I want it to be available to. Every one of us rely on computers in our everyday lives. Transportation, banking, Wall Street. Somehow a computer touches us in everything we do. When we pick up the phone, it's a computer. And people, they don't, they're not familiar with the technology, think that it's just this mystical, magical thing that this guy out there that's public enemy number one could manipulate and, and, and bring everything crashing down. 
When the FBI finally caught up with public enemy number one, he was living in North Carolina under the pseudonym Tom Case. FBI, open the door and report to your arrest. You got the wrong guy. Check the mailbox. He's upstairs. Right away, I get on the telephone. I let my family know where I am because they had no idea that I was in North Carolina. Hey. I get a hold of my attorney. Just a minute. And I let him know that I had the FBI at the door. I ended up like popping open the door just to crack to go, well, who, who are you? And right away, the door pushes in and they go, are you Kevin Mitnick? I go, no. I said, I'm Tom Case and why are you guys in my house? Don't you check the mailboxes before barging in on somebody? I acted very naive and angry. I go, do you have a search warrant? And they go, well, if you're Kevin Mitnick, we do. I said, well, I'm not this guy Mitnick. So where's your search warrant? Eventually they said, well, we want to take you down to FBI headquarters and fingerprint you to see if you're this Kevin Mitnick or not. So I said, okay, absolutely. I said, well, just give me your card and tell me what time you want me to be there in the morning and I'll be there. And they go, no, we, have, we want you to go down now. You know, we're not interested in having you show up later. They go arrest him, cuff him. And I was under arrest. Mitnick was back behind bars, this time facing 25 charges of computer and telephone fraud. The case was so complex that Mitnick would spend four and a half years in a cell before coming to trial. He was thrown in a county jail. He was actually beaten up. A lot of things were done to let Kevin know that the government was going to play hardball. Uh, the government made it clear that they might indict him in different jurisdictions, uh, that he might have to face multiple trials. He did not get the uh, evidence against him for a very long time. The only trial Kevin Mitnick got was in the New York Times and in the media. Mitnick stood accused of stealing $80 million worth of software from the companies he had hacked. In his defense, he laid claim to the hacker's ethos. Copying software was not theft. To do computer fraud or wire fraud, you have to deprive somebody of their money or property. Well, money wasn't an issue in my case, and property, when do you deprive somebody of property, making a copy, are you really depriving that person of it? So it's very, it gets murky. The government never alleged, or was it ever proven, that I intended to use or disclose that information. The information was the trophy. It was the, the, the proof of the hack. Mitnick may have been a folk hero for hackers, but others didn't see it like that. I think the terms of the game have changed dr dramatically, um, and uh, the kind of moral justification you could make for hacking, in a sense, that um, spirit really resonated well with an earlier world, and I think it really is not possible to justify today in the same way. In 1999, Mitnick was sentenced to five years in jail, most of which he had already served while awaiting trial. It was a longer sentence than that served by many killers. He was let out on supervised release early last year. So I'm under such stringent conditions of supervised release that if I were to touch this computer, I, can't, I would probably get sent back to federal prison. Kevin Mitnick may be banned from computers, but he can get together with his hacker heroes, Captain Crunch and Steve Wozniak. It's more sensationalist to, to make it sound like hackers are a fear to our, threat to our lives and our securities and our money and everything in the world. And people who don't understand curious minds there's always going to be a group of bright kids that are a little bit technical and start looking beyond, you know, what if this, what if that? These pioneers find it hard to come to terms with hacking's outlaw status. But the world has changed, and all that's left are fond memories and relics of the good old days. Ah, uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, something like that. Does that bring back old memories? Uh, yes, it does. There's, you know, nothing I would trade for the success of Apple except that year I'd never give up. One year at Berkeley. And before that, yeah. there is a Captain Crunch whistle. Up next, join the Mad Boys of Pizza, followed by the antics of Kyle, Stan, Kenny, and Cartman in South Park.
Spies. Spies.